Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues. Today is the 19th of April, 2023. It's two o'clock in the afternoon here in Vienna, and I'm pleased to introduce Marta Cantero Gamito to you, who is an associate professor in IT law at the University of Tartu in Estonia in the IT law program there since 2018. Previously to that, she has worked at the London School of e Economics and the University of Helsinki. She obtained her PhD degree at the European University Institute in Florence and has held visiting positions at institution, institutions such as the University of Ax Oxford, the Max Planck Institute for Ausländisches und Internationales Privatrecht and Harvard Law School. She writes on regulation and governments of uh, governance of information technology. And recently she's doing this at the European University Institute in Florence. So, so she's back there again where she is in particular working as a research fellow on in the School of Transnational Governance. Um, I'm very pleased to have her with us today. The main reason why um, I invited her and she kindly accepted this invitation is this paper that just got, got published also in a physical printout recently in the Computer Law and Security um, Review which is on the European Media Freedom Act as a meta-regulation. So you can either read it in printed format or you can read it electronically um, if you have a university access, even without any further uh, ado, it's easily accessible. And I read this article and I found that article very, very relevant and interesting in particular because this article tries something which is, in my view, almost impossible very diligently and very um, very convincingly, which is uh, to put the European Media Freedom Act into some context with other legislative approaches that are taken by the European legislator, in particular with the uh, DSA, uh, which is one of the pieces uh, of legislation Marta has been working on quite intensely. The context of today's talk uh, is this, on the one hand, it's a proposal for a regulation uh, that was published um, some weeks ago, and I will not uh, go into any details here. I just want to share with those of you watching this, so seeing my screen, I just want to show with, for, with those of you watching this how lengthy uh, this text is. So I'm still scrolling, 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 and I'm still in the recitals, but not even at the main text, and scrolling and scrolling. Here's the main text. So it's a huge, huge piece of legislation again uh, proposed by the European Commission here. And the, the second aspect, uh, to put uh, this into context, uh, Marta's text is something which is very, very up to date today, uh, because uh, today on the 19th of April 2023, literally in the hour when we are streaming and recording this, there is a debate in the Austrian Parliament, im Nationalrat, today about the new or the next steps in reforming the regulatory framework um, of Austria, in particular uh, when it comes to quality media, so-called quality media, um, and, and in particular also when it comes to one of Austria's newspapers, Die Wiener Zeitung, which is, as you might know, the oldest printed newspaper worldwide and where the legislator now, at least some, uh, at least as it looks today, uh, the legislator now sets a framework which makes it impossible to continue with the publication of this newspaper in the format it was published for so, so, so many years now. Um, the, the context of today's debate in the Austrian parliament is also that Austria has not really done well in the last years when it comes to an assessment of freedom of the media in this country. What those of you watching um, see at the moment is the most recent website report from Reporters Without Borders on the country from 2022. And what you see here is, is that the position of Austria has fallen significantly from position 17 in 2021 to position 31 in 2022. And the very first sentence of this report is, I quote, in Austria, press freedom has been undermined by various political pressures or restrictions on access to information. Violence at public events prevented journalists from reporting freely. And the very, very first point then reported on the existing landscape in this country is dealing with uh, the demise of the oldest daily newspaper, Die Wiener Zeitung. Um, and then quite some more 
of not so positive um, aspects of the regulatory framework and the and the economical framework of Austria's media landscape in this report. So, Marta, my very first question, therefore, going to you, if I may, um, I, of course, you you should not and you will not comment on any of the specificities of the Austrian media landscape and the regulatory framework in this country. However, from an abstract level, do you think that any of those debates, which is about how the legislator uh, is able or should be able to steer um, the, the well-being of traditional media in comparison with platforms, whether any of those aspects in abstract would be influenced, and if so, into which direction influenced by this new uh, act, if it should ever come into life. Thank you very much, Nicolaus. It is my pleasure actually to be here today talking about Media Freedom and the Media Freedom Act as a proposal. Uh, I'm very happy that my paper actually like called your attention and that you wanted to discuss with me on what it means with regard to the new understandings of media today in the 21st century. So um, going directly into your question, the, 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 very, the very same problem, and, and it's very interesting, the issue that you've mentioned regarding Austria, and this is something that we are going to discuss at length, because... My main um, prognosis regarding the proposal that is currently on the table is that if it ever gets to see the light, it's going to be perhaps in a very long time from now because of the amount of discussions that are expected with regard to this already controversial instrument. Uh, and we will maybe proceed step by step. But going to your question on whether it is the actual road for the legislator to look into um, regulated media services and in the way that they actually try to regulate um, very large online platforms such as is the case of the Digital Services Act, it's something that it's at the core of the problem with the definition of media services. Uh, the European Media Freedom Act proposal that you very nicely have introduced includes uh, a definition of media services, yet this definition is not entirely clear what it will encompass, whether it will encompass only traditional media services providers or whether it will also encompass new and emerging media services. So this is important because as, uh, exactly, we have there the definition. This is important because once we try to, as lawyers, try to delimit the scope and trying to understand what is the applicability of these rules and what will be the subjects that will be subject to these rules, we need to understand precisely uh, what is the interaction with all the potentially applicable rules that, by the nature of the services that these providers um, uh, provide, so they, they actually can can in a way like uh, be actually caught by different pieces. Uh, once again, uh, we don't know exactly what is going to be the final text. Uh, we presume that there's going to be a lot of discussion about the actual scope. But in essence, uh, there are many issues that need to be resolved among the different DGs uh, within the European Commission if they uh, want to actually help uh, uh, providers in the digital single market to provide their services while complying with the legislation. So. In short, um, so far, there is a lot of discussion uh, to take place with regard to the scope of this regulation. Absolutely. And just to um, put a little bit more uh, onto this, um, I would like to share with you one of the official publications coming uh, with the presentation of this suggestion, because nobody has the time to read all those pages. So as usual, the Commission is is presenting something mm -hmm. which is in this uh, in this case uh, a kind of a fact sheet or a fact site offered mm -hmm. uh, by the commission and if you look into this I mean the first thing that is very funny already are all those logos that they now now use uh, but if you look into what what the priorities of this um, of this act might be uh, the first thing that you see here is no interference in editorial decisions of media. And then the second point is no spyware against journalists. The third one is independent and adequately funded public service media. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one is transparency of ownership. 
to anyone working in media, this very much looks like a random list of different issues, um, mm -hmm. each of them certainly being important, but none of them being structurally or, or legally or, or theoretically be, being brought together in a way. Mm -hmm. And this is this is no no coincidence, if I understand you correctly, because it already starts with the very definition of what what should be in scope of all this and whether mm -hmm. platforms or not should be in scope, because the definition that you mentioned is, in my view, very unclear on this, stating mm -hmm. that a media service is blah, 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 blah. And at the end, under the editorial responsibility of a media service provider, which mm -hmm. is then um, defined as something which is someone whose professional activity is to provide a media service and who has editorial responsibility, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and the elephant in the room, obviously, is what and what not should be covered mm -hmm. by this, mm -hmm. in particular because of the DSA just being recently um, on the table and, and making mm -hmm. it its way through the legislative process and, and not even yet digested in the different national systems yet, and already the next step is coming. So my, my, my question to you, Marta, would be to comment on this development from your perspective, perhaps also from the perspective on your, from your article, which is obviously mm -hmm. much more fundamental and much more academic than, uh, mm -hmm. than the day-to-day -day political debate. Absolutely. I'm going to go step by step. And first, I'm going to continue like making some remarks on the scope. Mm -hmm. The issue of the scope is is uh, is one that I agree with you, and, and and as I already anticipated, is is gonna cause a lot of controversy because it is not entirely clear to which uh, to, to what is the intention of this. Whether we are addressing big media corporations or whether you are actually with the legislation trying to address anybody who provides a media service, and the issue, uh, or at least the scope, says. Uh, professionally. But um, if Niaus, for instance, if instead of you uh, being an academic who does this program today, Ars Boni, um, Mm. As uh, not only as part of like uh, an additional activity to your academic life and and probably like pro bono you don't you don't get any 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 pay for it or you don't have any sponsors etc. If instead of that you will do it professionally from your living room from uh, your garage. Mm. Um, does it mean that because you have the editorial responsibility of that program that you will have to comply with the European Media Freedom Act? One might think that that is the purpose of it. The thing is that, as you rightly mentioned, it's kind of like a basket where the European Commission have tried to put a lot of the issues that were not resolved elsewhere. And uh, it touches upon issues related to ownership. It touches upon issues related to competition, etc. So it's not entirely clear what is the... I mean, the proposal is on the table, but we do not know for sure what is going to be the result after it goes through the legislative process. We can discuss this more at length later, but mm -hmm. starting with the point of what is the actual purpose of this piece of legislation? There is a clear objective, and the objective is that uh, citizens located in the European Union should have a right to actually access uh, a, plurality, a plurality of views when they consume media services. And that is clear. But the, the variety of mechanisms and tools that this piece of legislation puts on the table with a view to achieve that objective, it's in a way creating more confusion that it wouldn't if the design would have been centered around what the legislation actually wants to do. And this is why now different member states, uh, including Germany, are actually pushing for a separation of the two different issues that the legislation or the proposal tries to achieve. Uh, I don't know if, if you want me to continue on this line or Absolutely. if you want to actually Please, ask go, go. Go ahead. specific no, no, go questions ahead. about it. Please. Okay, go so ahead. I go ahead. Um, <laughs> this legislation has two main purposes. One of them is to preserve media independence, so that to preserve the media services providers are independent, okay? And then the second one, it, it is actually connected to the first, is to promote transparency of media ownership, meaning that as users, we should know that 
it's X or Y media service provider. I don't want to name uh, to name anyone. Um, are financially independent that the uh, status of competition in a national market is healthy, that there are enough media services providers, that market are not concentrated, etc. And for that purposes, the uh, commission has used a very uh, sensible um, choice as a legal basis, which is Article 114 of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union, that enables the European Union to actually put forward proposals for, uh, for harmonizing the internal market. So in that regard, it is good. And there is no problem in that regard, because then we will be touching upon establishing the same conditions and uh, putting forward uh, or leveling the, the playing field for the different media services providers across the European Union as to what are the specific requirements that they need to fulfill to operate in EU markets. And that's enough and that's good and harmonization is needed and that will prevent some member states that in very recent years have had problems with their media markets at national level to actually deviate from what would be considered a democratic and healthy media market at national level. So we can imagine what would be the usual suspects uh, on this regard. The point is then that other than establishing a harmonized framework for a specific requirements to fulfill in media markets across EU countries, the European Union is trying to present this proposal as something that will touch upon um, issues of media plurality and it will touch upon fundamental rights. The question that arises is then, and is a question that I have been traditionally critical with, is the issue of using the internal market legal basis to regulate fundamental right issues. So that's an important issue. And that's why um, the proposal, if I may, and, 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 and of course, with all due respect to, to the officials working at the commission, but so far it looks a bit like uh, a Frankenstein with piece and bits and pieces that have been put together and some of which are sensible and in line with the actual legal basis used for this piece, but some of them are a bit more sensitive. And in, the, in this regard, it makes the legislative process and the underlying political discussion a bit more complicated. So if the European Commission really wants to um, see that these, these are rules as they are currently proposed actually see the light, they will actually have to look into how to um, separate the issues that correspond to the harmonization of the internal market with the issues that actually are more in line with what is like national um, media market. The reason for it being is that the competence to regulate media markets does not correspond to the European Union, but it's in the hands of the member states making the issue even so more complicated. Mm -hmm. Marta, if I may, I would like to uh, challenge a little bit both assumptions that you mentioned mm -hmm. as being the guiding principles of the Commission. And in my words, briefly, the first, um, the first goal you mentioned was helping press editors or media service mm -hmm. providers to survive in a challenging and, and, and changing mm -hmm. market. And second, mm -hmm. to put transparency into these markets so that users can easily understand what's going on. My question now to both is, to both ideas is, would that ever in principle work if whoever, including the European legislator, puts something into a law? Because in the one, in the first field, when it comes to the uh, to the challenges of uh, media editors. In my view, the main challenge is everything which is called social media or the internet mm -hmm. or the development of the last 30 years. And this is an ongoing process. We are in the middle of a disruption. Those of uh, interested in this field have seen this coming for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Europe is extremely late. It's very, very uh, much to be doubted that suddenly this market will change if a lot of red tape is again put on mm -hmm. media. <clears throat> and everything which is about social media 
on top has the DSA in the background somewhere. And when it comes to the transparency problem, when you are thinking about the countries we are not talking, we are not explicitly mentioning here for reasons of politeness, Austria no longer being that far away from that list, mm -hmm. by the way. So there are quite some people in this country here yeah. being quite concerned that we are the next mm -hmm. one on the list. So if you look into these countries, everyone consuming media there knows about the background of these media. So it's mm -hmm. known to everyone that this is state controlled or that the prime minister has a word to say whether something is published there or not. But it doesn't change anything in mm -hmm. the choice of the users if you don't have an alternative, which brings me back to the first point, which is you need to have free media in mm -hmm. the market being prosperous enough to, to survive in this market. And if you don't have them, you can tell the audience whatever you want, but they don't have an alternative. So would that ever, even if it were, if we put everything else that you rightly mentioned, if we put this aside, would it in principle ever be an instrument to solve the problem? Good question. Um, starting by disclosing what is my personal opinion, for instance, about transparency. Um, when, as you put, as you, as you rightly put it, when you do not have the choice, what does it matter that you know about um, what you are signing into or what you, the, the kind of media you are reading? If at the end of the day you do not have the choice, so we are we are not talking here about like a set of competition rules introduced by the Commission that will guarantee a plurality of views in the market. We are seeing uh, an issue in which there. Are just simply promoting uh, transparency. And, and in my view, we do not know to what extent that actually helps. Um, also because I might be wrong, I haven't been re reviewing the, the, the proposal lately, but there are no enforcement mechanisms in it. Mm -hmm. So with, with not having enforcement mechanisms in it, how do you expect a piece of legislation to actually uh, achieve anything? Um, so... And this is not because I am, um, let's say, arrogant uh, or something like that, trying to say that it's not going to suffer anything. But most of these issues related to ownership of media were already introduced in the revised version of the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, which, as we know, has not yet fully implemented in all the member states. And that has raised a number of issues regarding the implementation precisely because of the issue of disclosing uh, media ownership. And also because of the necessity to establishing a new body to oversee at national level uh, media markets. Um, I'm gonna mention a clear example that was Ireland that until very recently had not yet transposed the audiovisual media services directive precisely because of this issue and the transposition was due in 2020. So my answer to, to your question is clear. Like, what does it solve? Um, that has not been done before. So that's the prop. That's actually the key of the problem. We do not know to what extent um, we actually are going to see an improvement of media markets uh, in the EU with this, other than, and forgive me if I understood you uh, incorrectly, but other than increasing the amount of red tape when the actual problems in the markets are elsewhere, not actually mm -hmm. in the concentration of, of media power, which as well. But uh, if what we want is to increase the competitiveness of uh, European uh, media services providers, I do not, I mean, I'm not an expert in media markets, so mm. my, 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 my prognosis can be wrong, but I actually do not see how the European Media Freedom Act contributes to improve the competitiveness of European media services providers. Yeah, which brings, brings me back, if I may, to your last remark mm -hmm. about my own <laughs> little <laughs> attempt here. I mean, what exactly would be changed if I needed to start now to think about whether or not this is a media service in the sense of uh, of the act, right? I mean, this, this yeah. is, would be a very nice example of where, I mean, not that podcast in principle, in, in, mm -hmm. in specific, specifically mm -hmm. this one, but any other, right, mm -hmm. trying to do something from their kitchen or from their home, if they 
now needed to start to think about uh, and just another piece of legislation without having fully digested yet what Directive 2010-13, which is the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, would mean for them does not necessarily increase the competitiveness of the European media market. Um, that that mm -hmm. is the argument, and I think mm -hmm. you you would agree on that, wouldn't you? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But I, I yet want to 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 continue on the issue of new media services and the competitiveness of media services providers in in the EU. Um, the, the part I focus my paper on is precisely what is the interplay with, uh, with the online platforms. Mm -hmm. um, in the paper, I focus how EMFA rules will potentially impact um, online platforms. Yet, um, this is actually the, the elephant in the room. So it's like the thing that is somehow is mentioned in, in the proposal but it's going to be the actual key of the proposal. Uh, Article 17 and Article 18 of the proposal are going to be, as I expect, widely discussed. I'm sure we have all uh, followed what has happened in Twitter with the BBC account, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that kind of flagging, tagging is part of the idea that the European Commission actually, or I assume that is part of the idea that the European Commission actually has in mind when disclosing independence of, uh, uh, of media, that mm -hmm. social media platforms, very large online platforms, uh, actually disclose when and how uh, media services providers are independent. That's an advance, and to me that's something which is welcome. Uh, we have unfortunately seen what has happened in practice and we do not know to what extent uh, media uh, retiring from uh, traditional media understood here, uh, retiring from social media actually is the desired outcome that the European Commission had in mind when looking into that. Uh, but indeed, uh, I think instead the focus should have been placed on requiring social media to have a certain amount of media services providers from all the sides of the political spectrum so that the, we have the media plurality in the actual um, channel where we all consume media these days, largely, mm -hmm. that being like Twitter or any other kind of, of social media platform where we actually like kind of access to some of the news we read nowadays. So that is where, where, um, where we actually need to see the problem because these platforms have been acting and uh, continue acting as, uh, as important bottlenecks. So if by the reason of complying with a piece of legislation, we are shooting ourselves in the feet by asking um, these platforms to disclose uh, that first, it is a media service, uh, that is a media service, but also second, that whether they are independent or not, that may actually have the opposite effect of, of, um, of services actually not engaging in social media. So I don't know yeah. how you see this, Nicolaus, but uh, that is my interpretation of the issue. Yeah, I think I, I completely agree, and I'm much less polite than you are, if I and, and this is co probably coming with my age. So, uh, if I may, let let me put this a little bit more on the table now, because you you mentioned already kindly Article 17 of the uh, of the proposed Act, and and I would like to to remind both of us about uh, the content here and by quoting it. So Article 17 of the proposal says that content of media service providers on very large online platforms, which is mm -hmm. Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, etc. So the US platforms in short, <laughs> plus TikTok. So content of media service providers on very large online platforms um, is the, the headline. And then it says providers of very large online platforms shall provide a functionality allowing recipients of their services to declare that it is a media service provider within the meaning of Article 2. So hello, I'm an independent mm -hmm. journal or I'm an independent TV or I'm an independent podcaster, right? Mm -hmm. Hello. I am editorially independent from member states and third countries, and it is subject to regulatory requirements for the exercise. So, hello, I'm regulated. This is this is what I can declare. 
And if I declare this, then the consequence of this is section two, where a provider of a very large online platform decides to suspend the provision of its online intermediation services in relation to content provided by a media service provider that submitted such a declaration on the ground that such content is incomp incompatible with its terms and conditions, blah, 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 blah. Then this needs to be communicated to the media service provider concerned, including the statements of reasons accompanying that decision. So mm -hmm. this is some kind of a transparency idea, I think, uh, that is behind that. And then in addition to this, um, some more uh, requirements, as we know, quite similarly from the DSA, such as that uh, such decisions need to be made publicly available. That's in section five. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also all the technical measures need to be taken that this is easy. This is in section three. Uh, so this is very much um, similar to what we see in the DSA. Mm -hmm. My question now is what ever would change if that happened. I mean, then we would have just another stupid tweet from the owner of Twitter, which is no longer named Twitter, by the way, <laughs> giving stupid reasons. <laughs> and that's it, right? And then users mm -hmm. can decide on whether or not they, they leave and, 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 and European press or media companies can decide on whether they take it or leave. But that's it, isn't it? I mean, what is what is uh, what is the threat coming with this requirement? I don't see it. Help me. Okay, so um, okay, this is uh, this is an issue that comes close to <laughs> my actual research um, because the way I see Article Seventeen is a manifestation of meta regulation, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, manifest a manifestation on how how the European Commission is saying, hey, hey, platform, we have a problem. We have a framework for you. Organize yourself, whatever you see or however you see fit, so that um, this is complied with. And mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, when I when I wrote the paper about the idea of meta regulation was even before the proposal was on the table. So to me, it was a surprise to actually see that the the European legislate legislator was using that route, even though it was not such a big surprise, given that it is more or less the the new kind of um, EU trademark when it comes to proposing legislation because of the DSA is essentially the same or at least is the kind of only way to approach online platforms and, and, and to make them kind of like in a kind of like, yes, meta-regulated framework where they continue being self-regulated, yet they comply with a, with a set of minimum criteria. Mm -hmm. um, where I do see the problem with this, going back to your question, is that where I welcome a meta-regulatory approach to this issue being so precisely because if this is left in the hands of governments, then how are we going to fight the actual problem that we are trying to fight in the first place? So mm -hmm. given that platforms can self-regulate, there is no issue to actually let them self-regulate in a con context where they at least respect certain criteria. Because the problem with media freedom is the difficult balance for the legislator between regulating the market on the other hand and preserving independence from the governments who are regulating the market. So that's why in this particular case, I propose meta-regulation meta as a uh, appropriate regulatory framework for this. Mm -hmm. Why in this particular case it is problematic? Well, we wish it wouldn't be, but we have seen uh, what has happened with Twitter and the BBC, as I mentioned before. And also, we also sadly are experiencing what are the problems with code of conduct. So the got on, on this information soon after it was presented was again on the works to, to be amended. So um, I'm not going to say I'm becoming a skeptical about the role of self-regulation, co-regulation, but there is certainly something that is not working. And we as lawyers need to continue doing research and trying to identify what are the areas where a co-regulatory approach is preferred, a meta-regulatory approach is preferred, or where we actually need 
like hard law to approach certain issues. With this issue and Article 17 and Article 18, where I see a problem is that the meta-regulatory framework, in my opinion, is incomplete. Similarly to how the proposed regulation as a whole is incomplete because it does not include enforcement mechanisms uh, other than what the, the power that would be attributed to the European Board of Media Services, which is a body to be created and which most of the articles of the proposal are about. But the problem with uh, I can see it on the screen with Article 18, the structured dialogue, is that you are sitting on the table, or you as the Commission are forcing to sit on the table two powerful parties, but that they are powerful in their own context. So media services providers are powerful in media markets. Very large online platforms are powerful in their own domain. But when it comes to sitting down together, media services providers, as markets are nowadays, are the weaker par party here. Um, so that means that when you are forcing them to sit on the table, the guarantees, the procedural guarantees that um, media services may actually rely upon might not be uh, so, let's say, known to all the parties involved. Uh, um, so that's perhaps where I see one of the flaws of this, of this, uh, of this uh, scheme in the sense that they are fostering and promoting self-regulation. It is nice that they ask the parties to sit on the table, but when you, hang, you have on the one hand, we just saw it very clearly, Elon Musk uh, just uh, wanted to be provocative about the kind of instruments that they have at hand. And on the other hand, a media service provider, which is powerful in itself, but is not powerful in the context of the governance, the internal governance of a platform. I actually do not know how any structured dialogue does help um, potential problems that may arise between platforms and, and media services providers. But this is just my opinion, and we don't know actually how Article 18 will look at the end of the legislative process. But uh, yeah, that's my perception. Yeah. That's where I actually see the problem. Great, thank you. Just um, for those of you who are not that familiar with the text, um, so there is a section on on the board. Um, so that mm -hmm. is one of the key, and as you see already in this fact sheet, uh, this is one of the key um, things to be achieved by uh, by this um, act. So you see the board and, and the structure of the board looks very much like just another European authority or mm -hmm. just like another European board. Uh, with a secretariat and with a long list of tasks. And if I understand you correctly now, your argument here, and I would fully um, uh, follow that argument, would be that um, it, it is to be questioned whether this is the, the most effective enforcement uh, instrument that is available. Mm -hmm. Um, coming back to your article, uh, if I may, Marta, I think we could we could go a little bit more into detail here about what about your argument here by simply uh, reading your conclusion again and and reminding us and again reminding me that the main reason why I I find that so interesting is because you you are explicitly talking about this meta regulation concept in addition to existing concepts of self regulation and everything that we know since uh, at least the e commerce directive by stating here now that recent regulatory frameworks such as the DSA show that due to their capacity to manage countercultures, controlling speech, and ultimately increasing threats to democracy, online platforms and aggregators should no longer be treated as lemonade stands. They are too big to self-regulate. Yet, in the context of media freedom, a compromise shall be reached due to, first, the need to preserve self-regulatory structures as a buffer against undesired governmental control of media. If I read that now, um, my, and, and, and this is just um, what you already said at the moment, my question is now, again, shouldn't we then, as lawyers, also think about whether this is manageable at all by such an act? That would be the first question whether this is not something which is completely driven by the market. And the second question would be, 
just again, perhaps to invite you whether you see other deficiencies in, in the proposed act in achieving this goal. Well, that's a, that's a good point because I think perhaps given my intervention, I haven't really clarified what is my standing with regard to the intervention in media, in media markets. Um, mm -hmm. Goes without saying that I am 100% favorable and supportive of the intervention to regulate the markets. The mm -hmm. problem that I am trying to, to, to bring up here is how to do it in a manner that we do not end up as European citizens, European companies, whatever, um, we do not end up being subject to the actual um, uh, desires of non-European, very large online platforms. This is the key. And, and this is like on top of the sensitivity of regulating media freedom and preserving independence, as I mentioned earlier, precisely from the regulator who is regulating them is what mm -hmm. poses like this into a ever bigger challenge. So, um, your question is then how to do it, how to do it as lawyers, how can we think about like how to solve this conundrum? Um, and uh, it's funny because now you were just reading the conclusions of a paper that has been recently published. And it's amazing how I can feel already how obsolete it has become in just a few weeks, because mm -hmm. together with platforms and aggregators, maybe one should also include generative AI. When, mm -hmm. when now ChatGPT is all, all over the top at the moment, but like it's going to become more and more often uh, to actually resort to this kind of chat, uh, AI powered chat or whatever conversational mm -hmm. technologies um, to access information. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only news, but also the amount of papers that we read as, as a, uh, academics, etc. So here again, we have the same problem, but amplified times a thousand, given that um, that um, the, the, the when you look for something on Google, more or less, we know what we are looking for, right? So mm -hmm. it's a different way of searching on Google than it is looking into ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. So we now know that uh, this is an, uh, a technology still in inception that um, is going to evolve, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there is a lot of unknowns about what is the kind of information that has been fed into these algorithms to give us the output that they actually give us. So we are not talking here no longer about the prioritization of certain media service content within mm -hmm. a, a very large platform such as Twitter. We are talking here about that the actual output that we are seeing is going to be customized in a way. So we will be moving from a situation in which we are uh, exposed to certain content that has been produced by us to a situation in which we are going to be exposed to certain content that has been produced for us. Mm. So it's no longer like whether our content becomes prioritized or not. It's, it's about, so it's not a matter of distribution anymore. So it's a matter of production, how the content is actually going to be produced and presented to us. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the problem. The, and uh, and uh, I mean, I don't know what the future holds for the proposal, but with now the generative technologies being all over, I do not think that it is promising to end up enacting a piece of legislation that is not going to take this into consideration. Mm -hmm. Who knows how is it going to be done? If it's going to include like a reference to the AI Act that may or may not deal with generative yeah. AI. Um, right. So it's, it's a number of things that are put on the table and, 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 it, and it really changes the paradigm from knowledge distribution to actually knowledge production mm -hmm. so that's where where i see the biggest challenge of the legislation so as lawyers it's no longer about 
how to deal with the changing markets and how mm -hmm. online platforms are actually the ones who have a say as gatekeepers on 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 how how they present the information but also mm. on the kind of uh, of parameters that are, are going to be part of what is the information that we are going to have at hand in the future that's a bigger a bigger problem in my yeah. opinion yeah and so. I, I completely agree and just to add one detail uh, i mean it's one of the players nobody had on the plate 2 months ago open ai mm -hmm. was not really on the plate i think when people started mm -hmm. to think about uh, mm -hmm. this legislative act Absolutely. and microsoft being behind that was not really the main target the target mm -hmm. was meta and twitter and youtube Absolutely. and and so on right and it happens suddenly that something like open ai pops up uh, and mm -hmm. within four weeks, everything is different and we are still mm -hmm. struggling with the text that is not really dealing with this. And it's not only true, obviously, with the uh, with, with this regulation, but it's mm -hmm. also true for the AI Act. It's true mm -hmm. for the European Health Data Space Act. It's mm -hmm. true for the Data Act and so on. So there is yes, not just yes. one piece of legislation here. So, Absolutely. Uh, it's um, it's the, the question I would then have to you, Marta, as an academic, um, just like me, it would be how to prepare anyone studying law on this situation and how to advise then our students how to deal with this, right? Should they all stop studying law and go into politics immediately or should they should they hire and change professional? What what would you suggest to do as a lawyer and as a legal academic in this situation? Yes, and yes. The same question going to the commission. What would you do if you were in the commission advising them on how to continue with this? Okay, um, two, two not, not very easy questions. Um, the thing is that digital law nowadays over the last few years have been a moving target. It's becoming more and more difficult to actually, even as an academic uh, working on curricula, like trying to identify what goes and what doesn't go into a certain curricula. Um, but that's usually the problem. And I think that goes back to, to the discussion the, with Lessig's article on the law of the horse, right? Like, like not, not his own, but like that very same discussion. As a lawyer this day, and I, this is at least what I tell my students, uh, a lot of critical thinking. Uh, do not get overwhelmed by the amount of legislation. Uh, usually legislation takes time to actually um, be passed and to be implemented and so on. And uh, get familiar with uh, case law. This is what I tell my students. In fact, a few years ago, I, I had a course in which I was teaching regulated markets, not through, not through regulation and legislation, but through the actual case law. And uh, I think that's a way to see it, like, in, in the same can be said of digital law. Uh, it is the role of academics and commentators to actually follow the legislative discussions. They are, so it's entertaining for us. It's very exciting times, the ones we are living, and it, and it opens a lot of possibilities for academic exchange, publications, etc. some of which, by the nature of process may end up being nothing. For instance, like my paper, when you comment on a proposal, if the proposal doesn't go in that direction, eventually um, it's just only part of the discussion. The challenging part is the second part of your question. No? What does a new official nowadays sitting in the commission or trying to approach all these issues? That's the problem with moving targets. You're never going to be able to actually reach a compromise already in an topic that doesn't change that much, let alone on a topic that is, one, very volatile, and second, very political. So um, how they're doing it, I think uh, the only way I will suggest to do, just based on, on, on what for us academics uh, the problems kind of like may be, and this is just a speculation, is greater coordination among DGs. We cannot have a piece of legislation that has been promoted by a DG that partially overlaps with another piece of legislation proposed by another DG and creating confusion as to what should apply in terms of scope and overlapping competences. I'm recently wor working on um, 
how data protection and consumer protection applies you yeah always in the eu legislation applies to platforms such as tiktok and the problem is actually not the lack of legislation but the amount of legislation and the amount of competent authorities what prevent a proper enforcement of the rules that are already out there so yeah that if i could have like a wish list uh, for for officials working with legislation is greater coordination. I think greater coordination will 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 help. We all understand that the European Commission is a highly political um, entity, and of course, uh, we also know what it means for, for when it comes to to proposing new rules. Uh, I do welcome the initiative, though. Um, I in particular with the EMFA. We don't know what's going to happen because, uh, well, now the Swedish presidency has like a difficult task because the, the proposal is currently uh, first reading at the council. Uh, then it's going to be the time for the Spanish uh, presidency to actually try to reach an agreement. Um, yeah, I will follow with interest indeed. Yeah, let me just comment on this remark and then yes. closing this communication, yes. if I may, very briefly. I mean, this is already part of the problem, if I may, with all due respect, that you are telling us now rightly that it might be a problem for the presidency not to further proceed with this, because the idea behind this is that it's some kind of a success indicator mm -hmm. within the institutions that a piece of legislation is pushed through, right? Every mm -hmm. every official in the commission and every every presidency is of the opinion it's a success if at the very end there is a new piece of legislation. And sometimes I have the feeling that the success would be to say, if not, listen, <laughs> <laughs> let's go back to the start and let's rethink the whole thing. But you can't sell this politically and you can't sell this in your career, obviously that you successfully convince someone of not putting something into a legal text and and that might be one of the one of the underlying reasons perhaps why why we have more and more of legislation uh, not all of them being completely harmonized and not all of them being completely understandable for someone from the next dg um, with mm -hmm. all the implications it has absolutely absolutely yeah so we end with the final saying lawyers always can agree on, which is that there's too much legislation. <laughs> well, yes, um, it's good for an academic indeed. Yeah. Uh, and that, that this conversation, like any time I just think of the of the politics of any piece of legislation mm -hmm. makes me at least like be comforted on the idea that I feel comfortable being a lawyer uh, yeah. rather than if I would be working on politics. So, so yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Marta, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your uh, very, very op mind-opening, again, article that you were so kind to write and to publish with uh, right recently. It does have a lot of impact, just to remind all the audience on this, it does have a lot of impact on what we are thinking about um, in, in European IT and media law at the moment. I will literally go with this now into the Austrian debate back, uh, and I will quote you even more than I did so far. Thank you so much for this. Thank you to those of you who listened. Um, please stay in touch with us, stay interested, and in particular, stay as healthy as you can. All the best. Uh, take care and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.